For a long time now, it's been a widely accepted and rarely questioned belief that a strong corporate culture goes hand in hand with success. However, a recent study has cast some doubt on this principle. After all, the authors of the report argue for culture. A company's buildup may be strong, but wrong. There is little point in every employee marching to the same tune if they are all marching in the wrong direction. For a long time now, it's been a widely accepted and rarely questioned belief that a strong corporate culture goes hand in hand with success. However, a recent study has cast some doubt on this principle. After all, the authors of the report argue for culture. A company's buildup may be strong, but wrong. There is little point in every employee marching to the same tune if they are all marching in the wrong direction. We are trying to understand the locomotion of one of our closest living relatives, which is the orangutan, and also the locomotion of all of the apes and the common ancestor of humans and the other apes. And in that area, we have had a big problem traditionally, and that we know a lot about how they move around the forest. I've been out to the forest and spent a year recording the different types of locomotion they use, but we have no idea about the energetic cost of how they move around the forest and the solutions that they find to problems of moving around the canopy. And what we're doing here is using the park or athletes as an analogy for a large-bodied ape moving around a complex environment and getting them to move around in the course that we've made that they've never seen before. And we're going to record their energetic expenditure while they're doing it. We are trying to understand the locomotion of one of our closest living relatives, which is the orangutan, and also the locomotion of all of the apes and the common ancestor of humans and the other apes. And in that area, we have had a big problem traditionally, and that we know a lot about how they move around the forest. I've been out to the forest and spent a year recording the different types of locomotion they use, but we have no idea about the energetic cost of how they move around the forest and the solutions that they find to problems of moving around the canopy. And what we're doing here is using the park or athletes as an analogy for a large-bodied ape moving around a complex environment and getting them to move around in the course that we've made that they've never seen before. And we're going to record their energetic expenditure while they're doing it. I'm going to argue that the tremendous increases in productivity that we associate with the Industrial Revolution originate not so much from changes in science or technology or new inventions, where England was far from unique as from changes in attitudes, attitudes towards morality, towards what constituted the good. Attitudes towards property, which became in England individuals long before it did on the continent. Attitudes toward the proper role of government. And together, these attitudes constitute much of what the Luddites were protesting against. I'm going to argue that the tremendous increases in productivity that we associate with the Industrial Revolution originate not so much from changes in science or technology or new inventions, where England was far from unique as from changes in attitudes, attitudes towards morality, towards what constituted the good. Attitudes towards property, which became in England individuals long before it did on the continent. Attitudes toward the proper role of government. And together, these attitudes constitute much of what the Luddites were protesting against. Well, the banana is the first cultivated fruit. It's one of the food items that literally brought people out of the jungle, out of their hunter-gatherer lifestyles and was there at the dawn of agriculture which is what helped force human beings into communities. It's really one of the things that helped invent human culture. It's about 7,000 years of history, and the banana, from its center of origin, which is believed to be Papua New Guinea, spread out with people who traveled in boats across the Pacific into the mainland of Asia and all the way south to Australia across Indonesia and Micronesia and eventually they moved as far as Africa and even possibly to Ecuador all in this time and all on paddle boats and wind-driven boats. Well, the banana is the first cultivated fruit. It's one of the food items that literally brought people out of the jungle, out of their hunter-gatherer lifestyles and was there at the dawn of agriculture which is what helped force human beings into communities. It's really one of the things that helped invent human culture.
It's about 7,000 years of history, and the banana, from its center of origin, which is believed to be Papua New Guinea, spread out with people who traveled in boats across the Pacific into the mainland of Asia and all the way south to Australia across Indonesia and Micronesia and eventually they moved as far as Africa and even possibly to Ecuador all in this time and all on paddle boats and wind-driven boats. One of the things that people have said about agriculture is that on the whole it's more labor-intensive than hunting and gathering, and that's one of the reasons why people have looked to explanations which, you might say, are kind of coercive factors, that people have been forced into agriculture because they had no alternative. That is ultimately what may happen. But at the very beginning it could be that agriculture was developed because people wanted special status foods for feasting, that it was actually a social need. I mean, how much of what we do in our lives is generated by competition with others? And a lot of that is powered by desire for new things, new statuses, new whatever it might be. Respect, recognition also are important. And in small-scale societies a lot of those sorts of factors are generated by the ability to, for instance, throw feasts. One possibility is that some of these foods that were being grown were actually intended especially as feasting foods. One of the things that people have said about agriculture is that on the whole it's more labor-intensive than hunting and gathering, and that's one of the reasons why people have looked to explanations which, you might say, are kind of coercive factors, that people have been forced into agriculture because they had no alternative. That is ultimately what may happen. But at the very beginning it could be that agriculture was developed because people wanted special status foods for feasting, that it was actually a social need. I mean, how much of what we do in our lives is generated by competition with others? And a lot of that is powered by desire for new things, new statuses, new whatever it might be. Respect, recognition also are important. And in small-scale societies a lot of those sorts of factors are generated by the ability to, for instance, throw feasts. One possibility is that some of these foods that were being grown were actually intended especially as feasting foods. Perhaps you remember the dire predictions from the analysts. The fall-off in housing threatened to drag down the entire economy. High energy prices put the kibosh on consumer spending. Runaway inflation was poised to take off. David Wyss is an economist at Standard & Poor's. He says in the end none of those things happened it in the final three months of last year. Perhaps you remember the dire predictions from the analysts. The fall-off in housing threatened to drag down the entire economy. High energy prices put the kibosh on consumer spending. Runaway inflation was poised to take off. David Wyss is an economist at Standard & Poor's. He says in the end none of those things happened it in the final three months of last year. For four centuries the Viking declined, the people of the Shetland Islands off the north coast of Scotland continued to sell their goods through the North European Hanseatic League. The Hanses merchants bought shiploads of salted fish and in return the islanders got cash, grain, cloth and other goods. This lasted until the Act of Union between Scotland and England in 1707. This act prohibited the Hansa merchants from trading with Scotland. Consequently Shetland went into an economic depression. The independent farmers of Shetland had to sell their land and were then obligated to pay rent, eventually becoming serfs. For four centuries the Viking declined, the people of the Shetland Islands off the north coast of Scotland continued to sell their goods through the North European Hanseatic League. The Hanses merchants bought shiploads of salted fish and in return the islanders got cash, grain, cloth and other goods. This lasted until the Act of Union between Scotland and England in 1707. This act prohibited the Hansa merchants from trading with Scotland. Consequently Shetland went into an economic depression. The independent farmers of Shetland had to sell their land and were then obligated to pay rent, eventually becoming serfs. <laughs>